I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. I'm here today with Gordon Lawson, CEO at Conceal, provider of an intelligence grade zero trust technology that protects global companies of all sizes from malware and ransomware. To learn more about our sponsor, Conceal, visit conceal.io. Gordon, welcome. Great to have you with us today. Thanks, Steve. Pleasure to be here. Gordon, Steve Katz, the world's first CISO, passed away. It was a great loss. We filmed a special production with Steve in 2020. We want to play some clips and get your thoughts. I'm Steve Katz. I had the pleasure of being the world's first CISO, which originated at Citicorp in 1994-95. Gordon, it's hard to believe it was only 30 years ago when our industry had its first CISO. Uh, maybe that drives home a point we still live with to this day, uh, waiting to take action until after being hit by a cyber attack. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's fascinating how quickly the uh, the industry has evolved, and obviously a great loss to, to the community with uh, with Steve's passing. But I think he really set the stage for how the, the the risk profiles and the infrastructure that's needed to really have a great cybersecurity program, and obviously doing that with um, with City and and and, and JP Morgan was uh, was amazing. So Gordon, there's a lot more that's remained the same after all of these years. Security leaders are still playing musical chairs with a lot of movement from one organization to another. Uh, let's watch what Steve had to say about that. I was running information security at Morgan Guarantee or JP Morgan Chase, I'm not sure what the, what the title was at the time. And the rumor on Wall Street was that uh, Citicorp had been hacked and got a call from a recruiter asking if I'd be interested in speaking to City about a position in information security. So. Gordon, I don't have to tell you how pervasive headhunters are in our industry. Uh, they're catalysts for a lot of this activity, uh, you know, poaching CISOs from one company to another. Uh, do you think most C-suite and boardroom executives are properly prepared for the inevitable departure of their CISO? Well, probably not. I don't think that any any CEO or board is necessarily uh, prepared for the, when, a, when a high profile or a really huge contributor leaves your organization. Um, but, but I think, you know, just like in any competitive space, the, the role of CISO is so important and it's competitive for them in the, in the job market. And I think they have to take care of their families and go to the places where uh, if, there, if there's a better opportunity for them. And there's always a natural progression, but it's always, it's always a tough loss when you lose a good person. Yeah. You know, the average tenure in our industry for a CISO is one year. And I'll tell you, uh, Steve, with this SEC stuff and going after you know the Solar Winds uh, piece there, that that's that's not going to get any better. Um, I think that when you invoke personal liability and personal risk on people in a in an environment that's very tough to defend, um, I know there's more nuance to that case, but I, I don't I don't think the tenure is going to get any longer. You know, at, at some level, Gordon, after watching uh, Steve, w we can make the argument that information security had more boardroom attention back in 1994 than it does today. Let's, uh, let's watch this clip. It's going to require board approval because the hack did get board attention and the title would be Chief Information Security Officer, which was the first time that uh, title had ever been used. So, Gordon, you push for more uh, cybersecurity presence in the boardroom. I do. A lot of our colleagues do. Is it getting better? Are we moving in the right direction? I mean, here you have a situation where the board was directly involved with not only uh, recruiting Steve, but creating an entirely new position. Well, I think it was very prescient of that uh, of that city board to do that at that time. I mean, that was, you know, to put a C in front of a title, that's not something that would, be, would have been taken lightly at any point, especially in the 90s when this was, you know, an, a nascent industry. So I, I think, you know, a lot of foresight there that they that they used. I think one of the things, and yeah, you, you might get to it with, with that Mr. Katz talked about was for them, they probably didn't understand all the technological factors of this breach, but they understood brand and brand reputation. And I think that's why they hired him and, and gave him that title and gave him that responsibility is that um, you have to get ahead of that brand reputation or it can be catastrophic for your shareholders and for the business. So Gordon, CISOs are always fighting for budget. Uh, and they're trying to put out so many fires. They, they never have enough tools, never have enough people. Steve had the proverbial blank check when he was hired. We don't, we don't see a lot of that. Uh, let's listen. You know, we had the hack. So you have a blank check to set up anything you want. We want to make sure it doesn't happen again. And we want you to build 
the best information security department anywhere in the globe. Gordon, what's the reality of budgets? And I guess there's there's two types of spending. One is planned. You're budgeting for various uh, tools and platforms and people. Uh, the CISO presents a budget. Some or all of it is approved. But then you have uh, unexpected spend. You're stung by ransomware. You suffer a cyber attack. The company's down or the website's down or systems are down. Is there any Fortune 500 or large enterprise mid-market company that isn't going to spend and do whatever they need to do to come back online? Well, I think certainly business continuity is number one, right? So that those unplanned expenditures that are, whether it's instant response or getting systems back online, obviously that always takes priority. I also think that there's two tiers that in the industry. Maybe there's probably there's probably more than that, but I, I like to say there's two tiers, right? There's the Fortune 500 and even a sub-tier within that are top-tier banks that have nine-figure nine type security budgets. Um, then you have other folks that have multi-seven-figure, uh, maybe eight-figure security budgets. And then you have hundreds of thousands of other companies that will, that are like in six figures, maybe, maybe five figures. And so every dollar that they spend on cyber has to be extremely impactful and just supporting critical st systems, shoring up the most common vectors. And, and, and so, you know, I think Steve was lucky when he took over at, at such a, a large, uh, large FI that he was able to have that budget. But the reality is, is that most companies do not have a blank check. And so systems have to be very efficient. I think the other advantage Steve probably had is that, I mean, I don't know the exact number, but in uh, the 90s, what do you think? Maybe, maybe, maybe a dozen cybersecurity vendors out there, maybe two dozen at most. Uh, what's the latest number now is like over 4,000. And so, you know, the choices were a little bit maybe easier to make. You went to some some tried and true players and I, and I think you, you do get a little bit of vendor fatigue and that's why you have consolidation and those sorts of things. But regardless, from my perspective on the vendor side, when we're talking to CISOs, you got to make it simple, you got to make it affordable and you got to have tremendous value. Otherwise it's, you know, you're kind of wasting their time. So there's a running joke in our industry, although it's not that funny to the, to the CISOs. Uh, you know, we talk about CISOs being thrown under the bus, and really it all started with Steve, uh, and he told us the story. Let's watch. I'm sitting in my backyard about 6 o'clock in the morning in August because we take an early train into the city. My wife called up and said, your reputation is over. I said, what do you mean? She said, they just announced the hack at City Corp and announced, and they mentioned that you were the, chief, the security officer. I, Got into the office, my phone didn't stop working. Like, yeah, Cat, you just killed your career. So, Gordon, when Steve met with us, I, I just want to clarify this was a condition of his employment. He knew about this ahead of time. I, I guess the reality of it, you know, really uh, hit home afterwards. But it seems like CISOs are always the scapegoat. You know, now we have situations stemming from the Uber and SolarWinds hacks where CISOs have been faced with potential jail time. You touched on uh, regulations earlier. Uh, the SEC is going to require publicly traded companies to report breaches and cyber attacks within four days of when they occur. Uh, I was at a presentation the other day uh, and Chris Krebs, uh, who I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, said, you know, some CISOs may not want to be CISOs anymore. Uh, what's your take? Yeah, it's, it's a tough role. I mean, I think that, um, you know, this goes back to, uh, there's a couple factors here, right? Personal ambition. Do you want to be, do you want to bring that on yourself? Do you want to bring the responsibility of, of, of securing that? There's compensation that goes along with that as well. So it's not like, you know, folks aren't working for free and certainly Fortune 500 CISOs, I think, are compensated quite well. Um, but I do think that when it comes to these regulations and the way that, um, you know, whether it's law enforcement or on a civil side, you're going up against nation states or nation state funded criminal, criminal actors. These are very, very difficult adversaries to be 100% right about. And as Steve, as Steve said, it's about minimizing risk, but risk doesn't go away. And so I think it's it's really becomes a personal decision, but I would hate for us as an industry to lose really experienced, well-trained cyber operators that are cyber leaders, we'll lose them because they're fearful that they're gonna be in a, a lawsuit that could literally bankrupt them. Um, I think we really have to be careful and. And this is an area where, and I don't, you know, I don't know all the legal nuance here, but I do feel like this is an area where Congress, and with with CISA's influence and executive branch influence, you know, we can, and the SEC obviously plays a role in this. You need to be like, all right, we want to make sure there's transparency, but 
you don't want to be so punitive that you can't get people to fill these roles, especially when we have enough of those junior roles that are going unfilled because of, of other factors. So if we don't have senior leadership, it's, it really does put companies at risk. So Gordon, being a CISO today is far more demanding than it was 30 years ago uh, in terms of the types of threats and risks that security leaders are concerned with. Uh, and, and Steve was wired into that because he was still very active after uh, he retired from being a CISO. Let's watch what he had to say. The industry that exists today wasn't even on anybody's radar screen. It wasn't any part of anybody's wildest dreams or imagination. You didn't have the sophistication that you have today. You didn't have folks to gather credit card information, health information, and resell it. You didn't have a whole underground business of harvesting data and reselling it. All those evolved over time, as did the whole world of information risk, cyber risk, and cybersecurity. Gordon, you've been talking to CISOs for quite a while now. If you go back, uh, whether it's five years ago, a decade ago, as far back as, as you want to go, what are you hearing? Is, is this getting more difficult, more challenging? Is it harder than ever before to be a CISO? I think it's I think it's harder, but I do think that there was maybe another piece of Steve's Steve's interview where he talked about hiring great people. And if you're the business of risk mitigation, he said that he 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 uh, said himself he was not the most hand hands on technologist, but he had a very smart people around him that made him stronger. And I think that's the name of the game now. It's you know the 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 pace when you involved, I'm sure you can ask you about AI, so I'll, I'll, I'll jump ahead of it. But you know, the pace, the, the pace of uh, where AI is going, um, both to help cyber and to make it more difficult to detect cyber attacks, you better have some some well-trained folks on your team that that, that can stay up with that pace of innovation. Um, otherwise, it, it's, it's a very daunting task. Well, to those two points you just made about people and about AI, let's watch what Steve had to say about that. If I were back uh, driving the bus today, I'd bring on a bunch of data scientists and say, let's figure out how we can do this a lot smarter. We need to do a much better job on bringing AI and ML into information security. We're, we're still playing catch up. How, how amazing was it that he was talking about that, right? Like, I mean, you know, he'd been retired for a little while, right? And he's still, he was uh, well, well up on the most recent trends. It's just so impressive. So, you know, when we read the headlines today, Gordon, it, it can seem like AI is a new phenomenon. But as you point out, uh, Steve had his eyes on it. And I think a lot of uh, CISOs have as well for the past few years, even though, you know, it's emerging in, in the news media much more. Uh, how essential is AI, in your opinion, to the future of not just cybersecurity, but, uh, you know, I, I hate to ask, but cybercrime? Uh, I mean, it's it's critical, Steve. I mean, I, I know I've shared with, with you and your listeners before, if, if we didn't have those components into just our solution here at Conceal, we would be dependent on threat feeds. We'd be dependent on a kind of an old way of doing things. Like you have to dig into the metadata. You have to dig into the newest trends. You have to have learning models that that see what these, what the way these threat actors are evolving their vectors. So on the defensive side and the prevention side, detection side, AI is critical. For the bad guys, as I've always said, that this is like a the the best open source scraping um, tool that you could possibly have. You can you can target attacks so well against people. You can really dig into the psychology here and make the odds of someone falling for a phishing attack so much higher by using AI. So I think we have a very significant challenge uh, ahead of us, and and better be incorporating it in, into all of our tools. Well, Gordon, I really uh, appreciate you coming on with us today, uh, keeping Steve's strategies and insights alive. I think it's really important for our industry, and hopefully uh, you and I can you know, do some more of that mixed in with uh, some of our other media over the next year. Well, we lost a, a great leader, and uh, please you know, pass on uh, my condolences to his family, but I'm uh, really excited that we could keep his legacy alive a little bit with, uh, with our discussion. I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. This interview was sponsored by Conceal, provider of an intelligence grade zero trust technology that protects global companies of all sizes from malware and ransomware. To learn more, visit conceal.io. You can keep up with all of our media at cybercrimemagazine.com.